Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, my name's Tom Gash, and I'm Director of Research at the Institute for Government. I just wanted to be uh, very briefly welcome you to the Institute today for 30 seconds and to explain the one change in the program, which is that instead of Jill Rutter being chair today, we're very lucky to have um, Rob uh, Doubleday, from the, he's the Executive Director of the Centre for Science and, uh, Pol Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge, who will chair proceedings for us. I also wanted to take this chance to say a big thank you to the Royal Society of Chemistry for making this event possible, and of course to the Government Office of Science for their work in producing this report and giving us the chance to discuss it today. Um, without further ado, I'll hand over to someone who's very instrumental in making this event happen, and that's Robert Parker uh, from the Royal Society of Chemistry. Thanks very much, uh, Tom, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here to show the Royal Society of Chemistry's support for ensuring sound scientific evidence is at the heart of government's policy making. At the Royal Society of Chemistry, we are the world's leading chemistry community. We're a not-for-profit organization with 50,000 members around the world and a heritage going back more than 170 years. But we also have an ambitious vision for the future. As part of that, we're trusted providers of top quality chemical science knowledge, whether that's in giving reliable, trusted and evidence-based advice for governments or through our Queen's award-winning international science publishing operation. We have a real understanding and depth of understanding of the skills needs for the future of chemistry and chemists, investing £5 million a year in chemistry education and providing professional recognition for chemists of all backgrounds. And we spend a lot of time bringing together communities of people who care about the chemical sciences, whether they're Nobel laureates or primary pupils. We also campaign on a wide range of issues in the wider science sector. You will find details of two of our current campaigns on your chairs, on government funding for science and specialist science teaching in schools, both of which are incredibly important. <coughs> By continuing to evidence, committing to evidence and risk-based policy making in government and beyond, we can ensure that Britain continues to maximise its potential in science. In, here in Britain, we're a great science nation, and this scientific prowess, prowess powers our economy. For example, the chemical manufacturing sector has a turnover of £60 billion, <coughs> pounds, employs 500,000 people, and has a trade surplus of £5 billion. For every one pound of government money spent on R&D, private sector R&D output increases by 20 pence in perpetuity. So it's vital that government has people like Sir Mark at its heart to ensure this value is both acknowledged and used in an appropriate manner. For example, on climate change, along with the Institution of Chemical Engineers, we recently reasserted the value of chemical sciences community in the contributions to tackling climate change. The chemical sciences help us to understand, mitigate, and adapt the climate, climate change. The best evidence is based on the best science and that's essential to inform the right policy decisions on all three fronts. The role of the chief scientific advisor is crucial to making sure that science has a strong voice in government. At the European level, there's some uncertainty at the moment as the post of CSA to the Commission President is being abolished. I know we're all waiting to find out exactly how evidence-based EU policy making will be supported effectively in the future. But fortunately, no such uncertainty here, and I know we'll all be interested to hear what Sir Mark has to say. So it's now my pleasure to hand over to Dr. Rob Doubleday, who, as you've heard, is Executive Director of the Centre for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge, and will be your chair for today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, everybody, for coming to this, which is an innovation on innovation, the first Government Chief Scientific Advisor's Annual Report, and we're very lucky to have the man himself, Sir Mark, who will introduce the report at this launch. And then we'll follow that with two comments uh, from authors in the report from uh, Tim O'Riordan, uh, Emeritus Professor at uh, University of East Anglia and Fellow of the British Academy, and Lisa Jardine, who's a professor at UCL and until recently was chair of the HFEA. So the idea is that we'll have the introduction to the report, uh, two uh, brief comments on the report, and then we'll open up uh, to discussion. So with that, I'll ask Sir Mark to 
<coughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, so it's very important to say thank you, and there are a lot of thank yous around this report, actually. I want to say thank you to the RSC and to the IFG for hosting the event. Um, but importantly, I want to say thank you to my team who have put in an enormous amount of work um, over the whole year of gestation. And I can tell you they have been working intensively hardly on this, and I think they should be justifiably proud, proud of the outcome. So Liz Serkovic, Mike Edbury, Graham Collinson, and Jack Wardle, thank you to all of you. And thank you also to Claire Craig, who is co-author with me on the summary report. Um, let me just say a little bit about the progress of the report. So I have unashamedly cribbed the idea of doing this from something that uh, my colleague, Dame Sally Davis, has done for the past few years. So as the chief medical officer, she has a statutory obligation, which is to produce a report on the state of the health of the nation. And that goes back for donkey's years. Uh, but it was her idea a few years ago that she would do a themed annual report. Um, and uh, one example of that was the report that she did on antimicrobial resistance which I think it's fair to say has had a global impact. Um, and I, I hope it's not overambitious to think that this report, in a different way, on a rather broader topic than antimicrobial resistance in some ways, um, will have the same uh, potential for impact, because it is extraordinarily important. Um, and in terms of the process for doing this, this isn't actually simply an edited collection of contributions. So I want to say thank you now to the team of people who are responsible for authoring the different chapters, the case studies of the report. Um, and it wasn't just a question of sending out a letter saying, please write a chapter on X. Um, the very structure of the report was um, essentially torn up and rewritten as a result of the first seminar that we had. Um, there were then drafts of the chapters that were produced. We had further seminars. And what you see is actually the product of a very integrated process where all of the authors have read each other's chapters where my chapter has actually been peer-reviewed by all of the authors, um, although I am accountable for everything in it. Um, and, and so you can't blame the peer reviewers. If you don't like it, it's me. Um, and we've actually had quite a lot of international engagement as part of the process. And so you will see in the back there are some international contributions. But we had seminars talking about risk and innovation in Copenhagen, in Paris, in Berlin, in Brussels, and in Brazil, at, uh, in Sao Paulo which I haven't been visiting for another reason. But, so it's been already <coughs> quite a widely discussed topic. And I was actually in Brussels last week talking about some of the issues around innovation in relation to risk. So now we will see if we can get the um, uh, not very innovative technology to work. It does. Good. Um, so why did we get to this topic in the first place? Um, the job of a government chief scientist, and I won't belabor this with this audience because many of you have heard me speak before, but is to advise the government on all aspects of science, engineering, technology, and social science for all of government policy. Um, and that's a pretty broad brief, so you need to encapsulate that in relation to the things that government cares about. And government broadly cares about our health, well-being, resilience, and security. And much of that depends on our infrastructure, both our built, engineered, technological infrastructure, and our, and increasingly our, yes, our IT infrastructure, and our natural infrastructure, by which I mean human, animal, and plant health, um, the geophysical environment, so weather, climate, um, in some parts of the world, volcanoes, earthquakes. Um, and so providing scientific advice in relation to that is a very important part of the job. Um, and it's also important, governments care about the economy, so it's actually about bringing together all of the sciences, and I include the humanities, Wissenschaft, it's one word that the Germans have got, we haven't quite got the same word that encompasses all of the uh, different sort of uh, knowledges. Um, uh, to bring it together also for economic advantage, and it's about providing science in emergencies as well. And so within a very short time in the job, I realized that actually discussion of risk and indeed innovation were going to be very important <coughs> parts of the job. So within a few weeks, I was in trouble uh, with George Monbiot over a near nicotinoid pesticide. Um, there's been a discussion about genetically modified organisms. Um, there are all of the challenges around um, embryonic technologies. And so there are all sorts of issues related to innovation and risk that come up every day if you're working in Whitehall around scientific advice. Energy raises all sorts of issues. And 
many of the challenges that we need. So innovation is sometimes viewed by some people as introducing risk, whereas actually what we often need is innovation in order to reduce and handle the risks we face. Um, and we face some pretty big global challenges. So we face the challenges of aging demographies, of infectious diseases, um, Ebola being a, a tragic example at the moment, of scarcity of resources, of the challenge of how we manage energy systems in the face of fossil fuel burning generating more than 10 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere each year. And we badly need innovation if we're going to tackle each of these issues. And I think one of the things that very clearly comes out of the report is that if we're going to do our best talking about these things, we've actually got to have a much more rigorous analysis of the terms we use, because sometimes one group of people think they're talking about one thing, and the people they're talking to think they're talking about something else altogether, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, so examples of issues around risk, uh, John Beddington had to deal with the question about uh, flying planes through volcanic ash, uh, management of bovine tuberculosis, um, flooding, um, and there are all the human threats that we face, the threats of terrorism, um, the threats of uh, human emissions of carbon, uh, use of pesticides and other agents in the environment. And that takes us to, I think, the first area where we don't tend to have the best discussion. And it's actually rather difficult for the, my co-presenters who, right. who, know what you're who have to, you know, that's right, they've heard it before, <laughs> and I've heard it from them. Um, so I think this photograph encapsulates some of the sort of challenges of discussions about risk rather well. Um, so the question to the observer is whether this Egyptian plover, uh, which is sitting in the open jaws of the crocodile, uh, what is the risk to which this Egyptian plover is exposed? Um, now the hazard here is pretty obvious. Uh, it's a set of very sharp teeth and some extremely strong jaw muscles. Um, but the question for the observer is, is this plover at risk or not? Um, and so the question to the plover is, is it vulnerable and is it exposed? Um, now the reality is um, that it isn't exposed because the, risk, because the, 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 the crocodile is not going to shut its jaw. It might do if it was my hand or your head or, or indeed many other species. But it, the um, crocodile has a symbiotic relationship with the plover in this case uh, that picks its teeth, gets some food, and escapes alive. Um, and so the distinction here is between risk and hazard. And risk is essentially a product of the hazard, the exposure, and the vulnerability. And in this case, the bird is not vulnerable, and actually the exposure is low because the jaws are not going to shut. Uh, but the hazard is pretty obvious. Um, and then the other terms that we need to think about are uncertainty and threat. And we sometimes treat the different terms in a very sloppy fashion, and as a result, don't have the best conversations. There's no question that we live in an innovative <coughs> world. Our world has changed dramatically by information technology. We've gone through the first information technology revolution, which was essentially about democratizing information, we're now entering a second phase with the Internet of Things, where we're going to live in ubiquitously sensed environments, which will create the opportunities for things like autonomous cars, and we're going to see a very different world. And in fact, one of the activities of the Government Office for Science at the moment is to prepare a report on the Internet of Things for the Prime Minister, which should be released at the beginning of December. Um, and as I've already said, a growing global population badly needs innovation, and these are the challenges that we face. So the report really picks up from a variety of different perspectives. And I think it's fair to say that it's not that everyone in the, all the authors and us agree on everything. There was a very healthy debate. And you will see that there are disagreements within the text. But I think there are some things that we do agree about. And I think we do agree about the importance of having good conversations about and conversations that are actually informed by the fact that we're talking about the same thing to each other and not talking about different things. Um, and so the example that I have used publicly on a number of occasions is fracking, hydraulic fracturing of shale gas to release, of a shell to release natural gas. And there is an engineering and science conversation about fracking. And the engineering and science conversation is about will the drilling cause tremors? Will the injection of water? cause contamination of water tables? 
and will fugitive release of methane gas mitigate any effects of the benefits of burning methane as opposed to coal? Those are the scientific questions. And in fact, just along the road from uh, this building in Carlton House Terrace, my predecessor, John Beddington, asked the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineers to do a report. Um, and they treated each of these engineering questions. And it is like any other drilling technology. Fracking has actually been around since the 1940s. It is not risk-free. Nothing is risk-free. But if it is properly done, as with any other drilling technology, then all of those three factors can be safely managed and should not cause problems. But we've seen quite an active discussion and debate with people protesting about fracking. But what they're really protesting about is can be divided into three different things. Some of them simply don't like fossil fuels. Some of them don't like companies. And some of them don't want the disruption which is associated by an engineering activity in their vicinity. And so we've got there a discussion about science on the one hand and values on the other side. And we've got a discussion about science on the one side and uh, a, a, an issue of the distribution of fairness, as it were, that I have something happening near me, someone else benefits from it. And unless we're clear about the discussions, we're likely to have pseudo-discussions. And so I had to appear before a House of Commons Select Committee, as actually did um, uh, Andy Sterling and Joyce Tate earlier this morning, um, and both authors, co-authors, and this came up, and the question is, we have to separate the discussions with GMOs about, and there's two questions. We tend to treat technologies as though they're generic things. And so it's actually a ridiculous question to say, are GMOs a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, is synthetic biology a good thing or a bad thing? It doesn't make any sense. The question actually is a specific. What gene, what organism, for what purpose? Then you can have a sensible discussion. That's the scientific discussion. But then there is a values discussion that there are some people, and some nations in particular, who, whose value systems look at it in terms of altering nature, and they're opposed to GMOs, but that's actually not the same as a science discussion. And so we need clarity. And part of my job, and again, one I discovered very quickly, is that almost every issue that a policymaker, in other words, a politician, looks at, they're looking at through a whole series of different lenses. And the job of the scientific advisor is to provide advice through the scientific lens, but recognize there are others. The classic energy trilemma of security of supply, affordability, and sustainability. Science can speak to part of it, but it can't speak to all of it. And so Tim is going to say more about these different categories of innovation, but there are questions about who pays for some of the innovations, what's character is my pain, your gain, something that happens in my vicinity, but I don't get the benefit. There's issues where science meets values. There are unanticipated consequences. The internet is a good example where there are all sorts of unanticipated consequences and new challenges as new technologies emerge. But we need to have a better conversation. Um, and equally, we need to think about regulation, and Lisa will say something about that, um, where there are all sorts of different issues which I'm not going to explore now. We can either explore in discussion or read the report, please, um, <laughs> of regulation. Um, and Lisa has had to work particularly in an area where science meets values. And that creates the opportunity for a very smart form of regulation where the regulator is dealing with an emerging technology, so you can't make all the rules in advance because you don't know what all the applications are. Uh, and having a conversation both with the public and with parliamentarians who, uh, who ultimately make the decisions. What science can contribute and is really important is rigorous overview of the evidence. Um, and I came from the world of medicine, as most of you know, and the world of medicine was transformed by the meta-analysis, by what are called Cochrane reviews. You can very, very, very rarely take a set of, you know, established clinical practice from a single research paper, from a single clinical trial. You need to accumulate evidence, and science is always, to some extent, contingent. There will always be new things that are discovered. Um, and so in medicine, we have the meta-analysis, the Cochrane Review, where people take all of the evidence around a particular treatment for a particular disease, and they put it together to get the best interpretation they can. And we need to do that more, I think, in the sciences. And here are three examples, um, one at a global level, so the IPCC report on climate change, 
and that's the sort of grandparent of all meta-analyses, really, in terms of its scale and scope. Uh, we've then got some of the foresight work, so the future flooding would be an example of that, and then a, a study from the European Academy's Scientific Advisory Council, um, in this case on GMOs, um, and the Royal Society has done work on GMOs. And frankly, the job of being a scientific advisor is so much easier when these meta-analyses exist, because you can really say that the scientific community have rigorously analysed all the evidence, and this is the presentation. So that's important. So ending, and this is a very brief summary of what is an enormous piece of work, um, it's important that our national priorities in terms of resilience are aligned with an evidence and risk-based approach. So when we think about things like flood defences, um, we need a much more coherent and structured approach to how we assess the impacts of risk in areas of policy, in regulation, and also in crisis management. Um, we need to provide the right governance structures and incentives in the world of regulation to get, make sure we get the most thoughtful regulation. And we do, given that we're part of Europe, need a science-based uh, European Commission, European Union, where policy is rooted in robust scientific evidence. And if politicians are making decisions based on values rather than science, then it needs to be clear that that's the case. And I think that one thing that has really come out of all the work across Europe is that we have to recognize that we do have different values around technologies in different European countries. And the question is, well, whose values trump whose? And that's where we probably need recognition that actually we need different approaches in different countries, recognizing that we live in plural societies with different democracies, and we need to coexist. So that's a very brief summary of the introduction, and I hand it over now to Tim, I think. So thank you. So, Mark, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me at the back? Um, I just want to say to begin with, that though I was an author to the report, I think it's a very important report indeed. And I say so for three reasons. One is that this um, pushes forward something like 40 or 50 years of work on the studies of scientific knowledge, which began in this country roughly in about 1980. Um, and here we have a report from a chief scientist department which has got a very high level of social science input and policy analysis and critical review of the way in which institutions work vis-a-vis -vis risk and innovation. And, and for an institute of government or for government as you are, that's an important theme. The second reason is we're in a world of great political turmoil, as we all know, and part of that political turmoil is a growing feeling amongst the members of the public that governments don't listen, that they're essentially making predetermined decisions for particular reasons, often reasons which are not to do with the public interest, but to do with certain quietly well-defined interests. And that is growing into the public mind that anything coming from government, unless they have some kind of very direct involvement, is likely to be disputed and possibly uh, not in their long-term value. And that's a big issue. And I think we are talking about capturing democracy and re-establishing faith in government. The third thing, and I think it's the most important part of this debate, is that Sir Mark and, and his team are really trying to make this something which is now to be reviewed by all institutions dealing with policy and science innovation, regulation and science innovation, and new forms of public engagement in science and innovation. All these things are, in my view, up for grabs. They need a thorough review, and this process under this report has started that, but has not ended it, and I think one of the debates which I hope the Institute for Government will take on board is how to promote that and take it further. But my initial reaction to all of this is that it's delightful to me as a kind of environmental scientist, and I like to see myself as being very interdisciplinary, that the social sciences are now getting a higher level of recognition in the science policy community. And that may sound like special pleading, but actually we're all recognizing that there's a new form of science out there which is not more to do with a conversation, more to do with shared listening, than it is with information exchange. And I think that the model of science over the next 20 years will be far more to do with capability building and giving people a sense of compassion, a sense of the longer term, a sense how to weigh different kinds of costs and benefits which have different metrics, 
and above all to be much more sensitive to the distribution of how costs and benefits fall on future societies and indeed on current societies vis-a-vis -vis issues to do with social justice and fairness and ease or non-ease of getting out of the way when things are uh, jumping on your head. We, in this report, distinguish between five kinds of risk innovation. So Mark touched on that. The first one is mostly around the medical field, where you have drugs which are, by and large, socially valued, particularly in the area of cancer research, but elsewhere. A lot of the new work on genetic technologies have this value. The question then comes, and NICE, the uh, National Institute, is dealing with this, is how do you share the costs of that when there are clearly defined overall public benefits, but massive costs in relation to some of these gains. I'm not going to get into that, but that's a theme that all the time NICE addresses, but it's a widely debated theme around the NHS and medical sciences generally. <coughs> the second one, which Mark touched on, is the area where you have genuine value conflict, and that's our friend genetic, genetically modified organisms, but it's actually surprisingly around and a lot of things. And sometimes the reason why we don't have good public dialogue is that people don't spell out how their values differ. And one of the great advantages of this report is it starts to ask the question, let's get at the underlying value interpretations before we start the dialogue. And that's not been done very much in a lot of these issues. It certainly wasn't done very well in GMO debate. And frankly, still isn't being done. The third area is known in the jargon as LULUs, locally unwanted land use, which is fracking, and deep disposal of radioactive waste and our friend HS2 and so on. This is a very common area, but again, be wary that these simple acronyms like LULU and NIMBY are actually deeply misleading. Uh, a lot of the people who are opposing fracking are not opposing fracking. They're opposing a whole series of things they feel deeply despondent about and angry about, mm. which fracking personifies but isn't directly to do with it. And it's the same with the deep disposal of radioactive waste. A lot of the reason why there's so much trouble was that people could not get to understand how they would be singled out for a particular deep disposal repository without apparently getting any of the baubles which are associated with the technology of long-term nuclear power. And that area raises the issue um, of how you deal with community investment, what you do about the communities which are affected by these kinds of schemes, and can and should you not work with a much more deliberative process of community involvement so that these communities are actually saying, how can we best use this technology and this decision about this siting for our long-term future and making the process much more beneficial to people. It's interesting the Chancellor raised in relation to fracking a thing called the Sovereign Fund, which is the first time I've heard a Chancellor of Exchequer raise this, that is equivalent really of a depletion fund. We are actually taking our natural resources out bit by bit in this country, including the so-called renewables like water and wood, uh, but we don't have a depletion fund. We don't have a mechanism of taking some value of that and investing it for the next generation one after that. So although I think there are different reasons why the Chancellor suggested a sovereign fund for the fracking process, the concept of having depletion into community benefit and a long-term change in innovation, because Mark was right that innovation is often about how to deal with risk and danger, that's something we should be looking at in terms of regulation and economic performance. So that's the second, the third group, the group around Lulu. The two others which we touched on in this report, and I think are really important, is that sometimes you have a technology, for example, the mobile phone, which has all the appearance of being fine. There was a time when I used to do studies of the mobile phone cooking your brain, but most people now regard the mobile phone as so important, and I think the technology has improved, that your brain is only partially cooked now rather than completely cooked. But my point, and I know you're getting it, is that most people see the benefits as being so overwhelming that they virtually don't want to get involved with anything called a downside. But actually, the mobile phone is terribly treacherous for things like terrorism and potentially very exciting for things like democracy. So we now need to look at those longer-term, subtle changes in a technology which is in place, but changes its face, changes its momentum, changes its interpretation. And this is where I think this report provides a really helpful signal. And then finally, you have this wonderful phrase, existential risk, the risk which you cannot possibly know will happen but could be all kinds of things in 10 or 15 or 25 years' time. My favourite is the antibiotics, because I think that we're going to find antibiotics getting into the mainstream of global processes in a way that could be very damaging indeed, and we don't have anything like enough understanding of that. 
And my other favorite is POPs, which are known in the jargon as persistent organic pollutants, because they couldn't actually be defertilizing the human species uh, in a process that might take another 150 years. But you could argue, and it's certainly worth arguing, that we may actually end the population explosion of the human race by simply becoming less fertile uh, over the next 100, 200 years because of POPs, which are ubiquitous and are slowly creeping up inside our system. But that is exactly the point I want to end with, which is we need a mechanism of constantly keeping in touch with these changing interpretations of values and technology. We need a mechanism of making science a listening, conversing, compassionate, empathetic process and not something which is simply about information transfer. And we need a mechanism for making regulation and for making politics about things so that we're constantly having referral to potential implications for wider groups of society and for longer term fairness and justice in relation to people's values. Because if we don't do, if we seem to do these things as well as we can, that's good governance, even though we may not always get it right. If we don't put these things in place following this particular exercise, then we're exercising poor governance, and this is why this report, in my view, is a marker for us all to attend to. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, well, I'm here as a kind of worked example <laughs> of the generalities. Um, uh, and I do need to say a couple of things uh, um, in the introduction. One is I am no longer the chair of the BHFEA, Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. My term came to an end uh, at the end of January. And that's important because uh, well, anything that I say today and actually anything I wrote in my chapter um, is my own views. Um, a wonderful moment, as any of you uh, in government bodies knows, um, because for six years I wasn't allowed to have any views. Um, and for me, John Humphreys once said to me on the Today programme, when he said, you know, what's your opinion on this, Lisa, this mitochondrial uh, transfer therapy? And I said, uh, John, I don't have a view. And he said, oh, come on, Lisa, you have a view on everything. Mm -hmm. right? No, no, as chair of the HFA, I had no views. And so this is a unique moment, actually. I agreed to do this for Mark Wolpert because um, I agreed to do it for him. Um, but this is the only time I'm ever going to talk um, since the role about HFEA business because I don't think it's proper to do so when you quit a post. Um, and also because I'm a lay person. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a policy maker, and I'm not a politician. The wonders of the HFEA and its structure are all uh, because um, Dame Mary Warnock um, uh, led the Royal Commission that put in place the legislation in 1990. And she insisted that the HFEA should have a lay chair um, and that every HFEA committee, this some of you will not know, should have a lay majority and a lay chair. So every decision taken by the HFEA um, is protected against the experts and the politicians by its lay majority. And believe me, and this I think is what I'm here to say, is lay people are sharp and clever and they can actually have anything explained to them as long as you don't tell them it's too difficult for them to understand in a patronizing way. So, um, what I, uh, I came into the HFEA as chair and my ambition was to create an open dialogue with the public, and I, oh, I don't want, I want not to use the word public, to create with, with those who were involved in any way with assisted reproduction. That is, um, those who used it, those who developed it, those who just wanted to know about it, and those who feared it from a distance. Um, I, I just wait while you turn your phone off? Um, uh, so uh, that was my first objective, and my second objective was to create a an intelligent and reasonable dialogue with the media in order to engage with the public, in order to educate, uh, because I'm an educator. In the first, the dialogue with the public, it was an unqualified success. The second was an abject failure, <laughs> as some of you will have seen from the fact that The Independent even went with a story last week about that the, the three-person babies weren't, were not safe, you know, long after the people concerned had been consulted in open consultation. Okay, so in 2011, having come in with these ambitions in 2008, um, uh, we were asked by the uh, Secretary of State for Health 
to undertake a consultation on the issue of mitochondrial th um, replacement therapy. That is, um, and I always give, the scientists will cringe, but um, uh, the human egg has a nucleus, think of a tadpole's egg, think of frog spawn, right? That's when they cringe, right? Um, at the center is a, the nucleus which contains all the important DNA information, and around it is what I would call the jelly of the frog spawn, and in that, embedded in that, are mitochondria which uh, are described by the experts as being the switching mechanism, the energy provider. Uh, basically, they're not quite sure what it does, um, uh, but um, it, they do know that if you have faulty mitochondria, if the woman's egg has faulty mitochondria, um, she is at risk of producing a baby who will not grow to adulthood, will probably not live beyond the age of four, and who, in the meantime, will have the most horrible of disabilities. So in most people's minds, this is like um, uh, the suggestion, I think it was from Mark, that, uh, oh no, the, the, the mobile phone, yes, that there are some things which are, um, uh, so much in the interests of those involved. I would have to say to you, maybe 200 families a year um, in this country um, that you really want to address doing something about it. Now, scientists, now I'm just teaching many of you in the room to suck eggs, but um, there are wonderful things about scientists. I come from a scientific family. I trained as a scientist and then moved over into the humanities. Um, scientists tell the truth. I mean, they really do, and the, it, it's a huge... Um, issue when it turns out that a scientist has not told the truth. Scientists deal in uncertainty. The public doesn't like uncertainty. Um, they deal in risk and in weighing risk. They deal in, modif in, in rapidly changing areas of human knowledge um, such that they have to modify their opinions, their views, sorry, they have to mod modify their views um, as events change. Um, that their, their results are always provisional, um, and that they will never, and we were given some very nice examples last week at a meeting about the chief government scientific advisors over the last 50 years, they will not, in the interests of government, um, tell lies, fibs. You know, just say a little, say that things are safe that aren't, basically. So when we were asked to go out to consultation on a very risky piece of fast developing technology in the field of um, modification, it is a modification of human embryo. Um, uh, we decided, and I think I and my chief executive had this mission to get um, the public on board. Now, I can't stop saying the public, but what I want to say to you is parliamentarians are the public. Specialists in fields other than the one that is being investigated are the public. The public is not a mass of amoeba. Um, uh, so we went out, and we went out to all of them. And over those years, we had consultation, small group, questionnaire, um, uh, seminars, presentations, uh, media engagements, um, and, and gradually opinions shifted from a fear of the risk to coming on board um, on the single condition, which of course pleased us, um, that there be a regulator in place who could be trusted to look at the cases one by one. Now, you know, if anybody wants to know more about that, um, I could go into it, but the fact is that the, what I've provided for this, um, for this report is a clearly worked example of how you dialogue with everybody who is not directly involved, how you tell the truth and explain uncertainty and explain <coughs> risk and still get almost everybody on board. And I would say at one point, you also get the people with vested interests. There have been polite discussions, but there are always uh, small groups with vested interests. The media love to produce the hysterical anti-view. I shouldn't have used the word historic, hysterical. Historical. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, the, the newspapers love, the, the BBC News or any other news, um, love someone coming forward to say, shock horror, I realize it's unsafe after all, or shock horror, they're not telling us the truth. Shock horror, shock horror. Um, but actually, what's rather wonderful is that that doesn't, you know, people read about that the way they read about what 
Brianna's doing this week, and then they pass over it and they don't dwell on it. That's the position you want to get to. So that's where I will actually stop and say that, that my co contribution is to say, could we please stop talking about those who are not in the inner circle on fracking or GM crops or climate change or embryo modification, um, and consider that as a democracy, we are committed, obligated to engage everybody in those discussions. These discussions are not special, and that's where I stop. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Samark, Tim, and Lisa. I think you'll agree of a uh, fascinating and, and quite inspiring set of views that are um, reflecting on and building on this uh, wonderful report here. I think it's very, you know, what, what's clearly come across is that the kinds of important questions that are about innovation and about how innovation is managed in, in our society pose these dilemmas about you know, where the risks, where the science, where the values um, come together and are intertwined, um, what kinds of approaches are, are, are the, the ones to take. And I think that the report is wonderful in illustrating that you can have a, you know, a, a very informed and sincere conversation that brings different perspectives that don't necessarily entirely agree, but shed light collectively on these questions. And the HFEA is clearly you know, an example of where taking you know, in, in engagement with the, the wider world mm -hmm. seriously can, can really bear fruit. Nonetheless, of course, the conversation has also posed some really you know, tough remaining challenges. How within the system of uh, regulation as it exists now, do we think about uh, the empathetic, the longer term? How do we get the, the, the science uh, contributing in ways that, are, um, that, that work to the best advantage? How do we deal with questions like, for example, Sir Mark raised the question about um, you know, within the European Union, do different countries need to weigh these balances differently and how does that work? So a lot, um, a lot to debate and I'm sure, well, I'm sure that the idea of this report and the evidence that it's collected is to spark that debate and continue that conversation. So with that, I will just remind you briefly of, of two things. One is that this is on the record, this is being recorded and will be, um, will be up on, uh, available in a, in a day or so. Um, and there are microphones. So please, when you ask a question, could you wait for a mic to come and, and introduce yourself? And I will take a, a couple of questions in the first instance, and then, and then we'll, we'll open it up. In fact, I'll take three, because the, um, so if we can start with Simon and then do two over there, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Simon Burrell. I'm Director of Involve and Head of Public Dialogue for ScienceWise. Mark, I want to just pick up on your um, point about risk, uh, about risk and innovation often reducing risk. And I think that you can see that in specific circumstances, technologies can reduce specific risks, but often they have knock-on effects on a wider frame. So uh, by having technology in, in cars and lorries to reduce crashes, you may well have impact on lorry drivers' kind of livelihoods, for example. And, and so I'm just wondering how how do you, within a political context, frame a debate so that you can use the right lens? And how do you decide where and when, as Lisa and, and um, Tim were saying, the public should be brought in? Because I think this kind of, you can have a narrow focus that doesn't allow the public in and too wide and the debate is no use for politicians at all. So how do you, at your level in government, frame the conversation effectively? Thank you. And yes. Andrew Watkinson, University of East Anglia. Um, innovation depends upon research and development, and as Chapter 1 points out, the United Kingdom is only putting 1.73% of its um, GDP into um, research and development at the moment, and the Royal Society of Chemistry parliamentary briefing very helpfully gives the time trend, which shows that it's declined over the last 30 years from 2.5% to 1.7%. I wonder if Mark's having, making any progress with government in persuading them to reverse that trend. Uh, Roland Jackson from, from ScienceWise <coughs> and straight also from <coughs> giving evidence on GM this morning. Um, a question similar to Simon's, but this question about bringing in the wider and the alternative voices. Uh, in what ways can one do that within our current innovation system? What are the sort of best, <coughs> best times and processes to, to do that? And do you think that the way that our, the governance of, of our innovation systems is set up encourages that or provides difficulties with respect to doing that currently? Thank you. 
perhaps someone, do you want to take the, the a Andrew's question first and deal with that, and then we'll take the other two questions which sort of address the panel as a whole? Um, well, I mean, Andrew's question is an interesting question. I'm not sure it's got anything to do with the report at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but but the, 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 I mean, the issue is a, a, a complicated one because actually a major part of the fact that the UK's R&D investment is um, at the lower end is actually because we have low industrial R&D investment. Um, if you look at the public R&D spend over the last few years, it's been maintained, there's been further injections of capital, um, and of course the case has always been made, um, both by the scientific community and by uh, scientists uh, around government, that science is very important. I think the arguments are actually very well recognised by government. Um, the question is why the R&D investment in industry appears to be so low, and part of that is almost certainly taxonomic by which I mean that if you look at our pharma and our aerospace and defense industries, they invest in R&D as actively as in any other country in the world. But we have a very large service sector in our economy, and that doesn't tend to talk about research and development, although the reality is it does an awful lot of it, and probably will need to do even more to maintain competitive. Um, but I mean, the answer is it's, uh, uh, it's, it's on the onus of the scientific community to continue to deliver the very best science, but also, if you're sitting in the Treasury, to make sure that that is translated into human benefits, be it economic impacts or human impacts on health and other things. Um, but the argument needs to be continuously made. Um, and um, you're right, we live in a very competitive world. There will be a new um, Science and Innovation 10-year strategy coming out sometime in the next couple of months. Um, and hopefully you will be pleased with that. Um, shall I deal with the other issues? Well, which yeah, well shall, I was going to sort of... Yeah. I'm bringing in the other, the other panel here because I mean there are two, two other questions here clearly are around how to convene and think about this, this public dialogue, mm. which one perhaps thinking about it in terms of government, how does government think about the timing and framing of those conversations and the other question really talking about think of it in terms of the wider innovation system. Could I, uh, could I start by saying that um, seeing two people immediately from ScienceWise that when I said that the <laughs> yes. HFEA embarked boldly on this big consultation um, about mitochondrial uh, therapy, um, uh, ScienceWise was run, ran a large part of that for us. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, when you asked that, I thought a lot of this, and I know it's idealism on my part, has to do with foresight. Yes. Because the trouble is consultation has to happen before the big science report mm. hits the newspapers and they pull out the shock horror headline. Um, and you could take badger culls or fracking, and that's exactly what went wrong for, the, for an ordinary observer, which is that on the margins of the main headline, there were people uh, on fracking, I'm thinking about Robert Mayer, going very sense, coming forward and saying very sensible things as an expert, but with a for the public's cons um, con consumption. Um, but the, con the consultation, I think, has to start while those activities are going on, while those scientific reports are being written. And they have to be, as you know, incredibly carefully structured. I mean, you don't just go out with a mic and say, hello, you know, what do you think about? You, it's, I think we spent, you, I'm sure, did the same. I think we spent nine months before we spoke to a person in structuring and planning um, the consultations and how they would dovetail and how they would interact. So again, consultation, well, consultation has become a word which means float the document around a bit um, and then come back and say you've consulted. Um, well, that's at one extreme. The other extreme would be to consult too widely, yes. Um, but it's structured, meaningful, um, expert consultation. You know, there are lots of people who are experts. It's your, your thing about coming back to the social sciences and who knows how to do what. Writing questionnaires is very difficult. Do you want to add to that? Well, I would make sure that we have plenty of comment from yeah. the floor, but yeah. the issue about dealing with alternatives, I think one of the things that I feel we should be re realising from this report, there's quite a lot going on in this country mm. around what you call science technology and dialogue. There's science-wise, there's the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, there's select committees, there's a foresight process, there's the chief scientist advisory process, and there are lots of specialised bodies, for example, two social science advisory bodies to DEC, Department of Energy and Climate Change, and to DEFRA. So it's not as if we don't get that. What I think I gather from what Sir Mark and his team are talking about is we need to make more systematic use of this kind of thing. 
it's in the system, and there are people in this room who are experts at doing that. But I don't think we get, and Lisa is making the point, and he's coming out in the questions, we don't have enough weighted analysis around some of the areas of policy and some of the areas of science and technology that we could put in without a huge amount of effort just to get to the point where we know the kind of things to raise for consultation. And I think this is really one of the messages from this. Organise what we've got even better, provide a better transparency of how that's working, and then set processes of public debate which are based upon that. One final thing, just because I think it will come up later on, never underestimate that the youngster of today, between the ages of 11 and 18, is incredibly involved with the issues we're talking about. And I think we need to do far more in mobilising our schools into the kinds of debates we're talking about now. So we don't wait for this to happen when you're over 60. Those are quite important, I mean, they're vitally important questions in terms of the, the issues that we're raising in this meeting today. Mm -hmm. So we need to rethink the dialogue process in the schools because they are doing spe spe spectacular work, but we're not giving that recognition factor anything like as high as it should, even, dare I say it, in this report. I, I just want to say something about in, in response to Simon's question, actually, because <coughs> I think I, I agree it's horizon scanning is the thing. And actually, if you look at what's going on in government, there is more and more horizon yeah. scanning, is more and more century. So the Cabinet Secretary has an advisory group around horizon scanning. I co chair a, a group with um, um, uh, Day. John Day, sorry, yes. <laughs> with John Day, a uh, senior moment. Uh, with John Day uh, around horizon scanning as well. It's a very joined up process in government, actually, you now. So, uh, and horizon scanning is the best you can do. So that, 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 that is very important. Um, and the other thing to say is that we are building on an extremely strong base in the UK. Mm -hmm. So firstly, along Carlton House terraces, we, uh, terrace, we have a series of learned academies. We have the Academy of Medical Sciences up the road. They produce excellent reports. Uh, we've got a, a system of chief scientific advisors embedded in each government department, always going out, talking to people, seeking evidence. Mm -hmm. We're actually starting from a very strong base. We have strong science journalists mm -hmm. in the UK. If you look at actually the quality of the reporting that happened after the, um, uh, the, the release of the Council for Science Technology letter to the Prime Minister about genetically modified organisms, about David Balcombe's report that came out about it, the reporting was high quality, by and large, not 100%. Um, so we are building on a strong base here. Thank you. I wanted to, there's lots of questions. I just wanted to say, are there any questions or comments people would like to follow up, particularly on this question around pu public dialogue? I mean, um, comments or questions. Yes, a woman here and then a woman here. Thank you. Rachel Muckle from DEFRA. Um, uh, particularly linking to Tim's point about um, involving young people, is the science um, community keeping up with the use of technology? Social media, Twitter, none of my young adult children have um, an email account, I don't need one mum, is everything that they say. During the horse meat um, uh, incident last year, um, uh, there was an, uh, the, the initial response of DEFRA was, we need to get more information out, we need to tell people this great assumption of a deficit-based model um, uh, doesn't work. And by using the social media, we followed the changes in the story, we were on top of the story, we could respond in very, very different ways to what the traditional um, policy response would have been, and to take the public perception of the risks which were changing as the story um, evolved, and so it really changed our response indeed. Thank you. That's quite Winnie Agbon Lahore from Civil Service World. Um, you've, uh, so Mark talked about we need to have a better conversation, and Tim, you said that we need to make better use of those varied views and expertise that, that's out there, as I understand. What, what do you think the government should and can do to improve its way of, of making use of all these views and expert views to in better inform policy making? Thank you. Um. Uh, David Walker from the Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, Mark Wapot used the metaphor of a lens, uh, mm -hmm. saying science advisors should be aware of others' lenses. Um, you're not saying, though, that the epistemological weighting of these lenses are the same, and if I can make a crude analogy back to what Lisa Jardine was saying, there is a truth created in the headlines of the Daily Mail. It's a truth which you, in your previous job, would have dealt with uh, in a negative way on most days, I would imagine. So how do you grade the possibility that some of these other lenses, these other assertions of truth, are 
uh, not what would be recognized as truth uh, through the science lens. And there was one more, yes, at, at the front. Hello, I, I was actually just interested in this question of if we need to have different processes to enable good dialogue, uh, better foresight, all those sorts of things, then how would you see that being developed as a sort of new capability for government? In, internationally, there are countries that have, I mean, France has this, um, this forum for public debate, uh, which, which largely talks about a range of topics, but also talks about things like major infrastructure and public, public views on these investments. But creating an institution with a capability, is that something that you've thought about and considered, or are you thinking about other sort of internal changes to build these new skills? And that, to make it tough for the panel, I'm going to take one more, <laughs> and then we'll pause. Uh, I'm Andy Hart from the Food and Environment Research Agency, part of DEFRA. Um, a little bit linked to one of the last remarks, but moving on to the issue of uncertainty. Um, Lisa was saying that scientists deal in uncertainty, uh, but the public don't like it. Uh, and from my experience uh, in uh, working with experts, in the scientists in the area of uh, food safety and environmental risk, what I see is that there's a lot of variation uh, in, in scientists' behavior in the extent to which they pay attention to uncertainty in their work and the extent to which they articulate it. And the latter is partly because they're aware or they have the perception that the public don't want to hear about uncertainty mm -hmm. and that maybe even policymakers aren't completely enthusiastic about hearing about it. Um, what the result of this is, is that the, the public debate and policymaking is less well informed about the degree of uncertainty in science than they might otherwise be. And so in connection with that, what I wonder is uh, in uh, Sir Mark's second conclusion, uh, that there should be a coherent and structured approach to assessing impact of risk in policy, regulation, and crisis management, whether he would uh, regard uncertainty as being part of that uh, as, as well as uh, risk in the, uh, in the narrow slips. Can I, you want to immediately come in? Because what, what it seems to me like we are embarking on a different set of questions around uncertainty, perhaps. Um, or do you want to quickly? Uh, well, I, I'd like to come back on that on Sir Mark's behalf. <laughs> because I'll tell you whether I agree with just you. As Tim, just as Tim started by saying, I'm part of this, but it's a terrific report, that's why we're talking about mm, it, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and the real, really important thing, and it's a little, we're slightly spraying off this, risk is easy, everybody can get into talking about risk. We can bore for England on risk, you know. But innovation, risk and innovation, the fact that, they're, that they are a, a pair that cannot be separated, and you know, in assisted reproduction, if we were to avoid risk, there, would, there wouldn't even be IVF babies. You know, we still haven't arrived at the point where we're sure what the outcome is two generations down the line. So it's, li it's, it's linking risk with innovation. It's talking about risk openly. And yes, I used uncertainty, and I did so throughout my chapter, because I think it's a slightly friendlier word and also because uncertainty takes you into philosophy and risk takes you into social sciences, and I prefer to go the philosophical way. But can, can, I think that this is a theme that we'll pick up again in a second, but I want to sort of turn back to the questions we've just had. We had a, a comment about how DEFRA has made good use of social media, which led to a couple of questions, which was, um, I think, fr from the front, you know, how can government, I mean, how can this actually structurally work within government? How can it take on board these different views and whether that might require a different kind of capability, institutional and skills in government. And then you know, a, a difficult question raised around um, in those processes when you have lots of different views, um, how are they weighted? Uh, so this is sort of a set of questions really to Sir Mark about how does all this work from a government perspective? Um, well, I, I, I particularly want to deal with the weighting of lenses questions because of course it depends on the circumstances, whether the lenses are equal or not. And ultimately, it is the policy makers that make the policy decisions. And I don't think it's about different assertions of the truth. It's actually about balancing different things. Mm -hmm. And so let's take embryonic technologies. There are two countries in Europe that really don't like them, or there are several, actually, but um, Italy, Austria, Germany don't like these technologies. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see that there are value-based reasons mm -hmm. why they don't like them. There are religious reasons mm -hmm. they don't like them. So it's not really a question of saying, well, which lens is more important than which other lens. It depends on the circumstances. In energy, you're balancing sustainability with affordability with security of supply. 
you know, how do you rank those lenses? Ultimately, it's the policymakers that have to do it. It's not a question of actually whether the science is right or wrong. That's not the lenses. It's not the people that dispute the science. It's actually different approaches to the same problem. And that's why we elect politicians. That's the power of democracy, ultimately. So I, I, I think that's how I would sort of deal with that one. In terms of the sort of forms for public debate, I don't think everyone in France would necessarily agree that that single forum is the answer to all their problems. Um, and I don't think there's a monolithic solution. And I don't think also it's entirely the job of government to conduct the debate. I mean, we all need to participate in the debate. That's the great thing about democracy. And it's a great thing about the new social media, as it were, because actually it democratizes, it, it gives voices to many more people. And I think it's one of the interesting horizon scanning questions about what will social media mean for a government in the future? All sorts of very interesting questions. The uncertainty point, uh, sort of Andy Hart's question, one of the big challenges is that you often have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so there are times when you have to act. And I'll give you an example from my professional life. And it was one of the things that one of my mentors said to me when he heard I was doing this job. He said, well, I think one of the things that you do in medicine is that you have to make decisions based on incomplete evidence. Yeah. And you do that all the time. So you see someone, you're talking to them, you're working with them across a, you know, in a white coat, etc. And at the end of the day, saying to them, I'm terribly sorry, I can't really decide the evidence isn't in, come back in five years' time, is not a good answer. <laughs> and equally, it's not a good answer in a national emergency where you are having to work out how to deal with an Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And that's where mechanisms such as SAGE, which is the Scientific Advisory Group in Emergencies, comes into its own, which is that the Government Office for Science assembles a group of people who are experts, who come from diverse backgrounds, who are aware of the evidence and who are able to put together the best picture you can at that time, <coughs> recognizing those uncertainties. My job is to communicate the uncertainties, but also at the end of the day, policymakers do have to act in some circumstances and simply saying we haven't done the research, it'll be five years before we have a vaccine go away is not a right response. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Another couple of questions. Well, there's three here, so one, two, three. My name is uh, J.P. Zagrand. I'm at the Land School of Economics, and I'm running the Systemic Risk Center there. Yeah. My question is about the time scales of risk and innovation. Uh, in finance, at least, decisions are taken on a short-term basis. Traders have bonuses every year. But the people who regulate the markets, the politicians, have very short-term horizons as well. Each one is blaming the other one for having a short horizon. But the risk in the short term is lessened because people who elect politicians are happy they can buy a house, rates are low. Politicians are happy because the risk of not being re-elected goes down, but the long-term risk of having minimized the short-term risk is very large, and there's this missing long-term link because everybody's quite happy with taking short-term risks, they benefit in the short term, and the long-term risks are given to the next generation, to the future taxpayers, and so forth. I wondered whether anything in the report comes to this time scale that oftentimes the really big long-term risk comes at the uh, at the expense of short-term happiness. Thank you. And if you just pass it behind you. Yeah. Yeah, um, Guy Poppy, the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Food Standards Agency. I have a question in, in relation to uh, innovation and risk. I mean, you, you've talked on several accounts how actually quite often there are winners and losers, perhaps depending on which lens you look through. Um, I, I wondered what your views were on whether winners should compensate Losers, you know, the, the the area of payment for ecosystem services is largely around people providing things for the common good, getting some money back for it. Thank you. And the Bruce Lloyd from London South Bank University. I, I want to link a couple of comments that you made earlier. One is about the the differences that you get in across Europe, and w the, whether that is a reflection of the differences ways in which, or degrees to which, uh, individuals across Europe have trust in the decision-making processes. And at the level of fracking, I wonder that whether that's actually a repackaging of one of your um, opposition pressures, maybe a fourth one, and that is that people don't like decisions being taken by other people that they don't trust. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether combining those two things, whether there's 
we need to ask more questions about why there is this lack of trust in the policy makers. Tim, do you want to tackle Well, there was a question in the front earlier about deliberative approaches, and then you've got two other questions coming from this, and also an interesting question from DEFRA. Uh, in a very short space of time, I'll do my best to answer all of this. Um, understand that this, what's called deliberation, getting people involved in discussions, isn't just about knowledge transfer, it's about capacity building, capability yeah. building, giving people a chance to understand better how different views are shaped and, and, and worked on. So we tend to forget that just the process of deliberation can be trust inducing, and it doesn't necessarily always result in an agreement, but it results in people feeling that they're informed, they're involved, and their views are t being taken into account. So the act of deliberation is an act of citizenship as much as an act of democracy, and that's really important to get across because we tend not to say that, and that's in the report, and it's said very clearly. The second thing about this very interesting question about gainers and losers and whether there should be some form of um, compensation for that word. Uh, the, the word I would refer, and we used it in relation to the radioactive waste, but it re it's relevant to fracking and elsewhere, is the notion of a community investment fund. And the point about that is it should be completely independent of government. So it would be r rather like a not-for-profit charity or something which is entirely separate from government and run by independent trustees with a highly accountable process. We did a bit of work in Norwich, my, where I come from, on this, because we were coming up with a proposal to have one pound on every parking in Norwich and using that pound for a, what we call the carbon fighting fund. And the public in Norwich really liked that idea, so long as it was not handled either by the Chancellor of the Exchequer or by Norwich City Council or by <laughs> Norwich County Council. And what I think we tend to forget is the deep distrust that people have. Is that they see every single time decisions are being taken without apparent reference to what is actually highly considered viewpoints, where people put a lot of time and effort into arguing something and see them being completely turned over for what seems like predetermined, highly power-based yeah. outcomes. So my suggestion is, and I'll give you an example because you're interested in biodiversity. There are two things for, to, for this uh, group to discuss. One is in the German system, the Bundeslander have a, an account fi funded by developers. So if you build housing or roads or pipelines or anything else, put money into an account and that money goes into enhancing biodiversity for everyone and it's handled by an independent body and every development is then is seen as being potentially beneficial whereas in this country almost all development is seen as potentially lethal it's a very different atmosphere because there's no mechanism for apparently gaining uh, apart from the so-called section 106 which isn't a big deal the second thing, and I want to leave with you with this, because I think it's, it's built into the report and needs a lot more attention, is that a lot of the things we're talking about is to do with changing behavior, changing people's outlooks, changing people's values on how they use energy, how they use food, how they use waste, how they relate to each other, how they look at the future, things of this kind. We don't do a lot, I mean, social scientists do, but we don't do a lot of marrying policy and science and behavior in a coherent way. And this particular case for long-term decision making. I'm working now with the Zoological Society of London around diet in relation to conservation and also to public health. Now, most people just don't see these things as relevant. So they just want to get involved. But if you get the young people into this, the ones who are going to be 40 in 20 years' time, they are the ones who are going to be the consumers of the next generation. So that's why I keep on saying, if you want to get into behavior change, you really need to work on a generation that sees this as something that it will learn and teach the next generation on above it, as well as learning for itself. And it's the mutual learning process between ages of our society, between the younger and the older, which I regard as something which is built in this report and needs a lot more attention. Rob, I just wonder, we've got a number of the other authors of the report mm. sitting in the room, and it would be quite interesting to hear from them, because they've done all, a lot of the work, and it would be interesting to hear some of their perspectives, actually. I agree. No. Well, uh, I mean, Andy, you, were, and Andy. you were trying to come in earlier. Do you want to? Sure. Well, I was going to, thank you. Yeah, thanks for uh, giving me a chance to pipe up. Um, an issue crops up in the exchange a moment ago on trust, yeah. and Tim Ariadne's response back referring to power-based outcomes. And I wanted to ask Sir Mark especially, but raised in general, it comes up in the report a number of times, but we haven't yet discussed it, that the way power works in science, in policy obviously, but also in innovation, has very recognizable pattern, patterns to it, um, which we don't tend to talk about because it's not polite. It's not necessarily a bad thing that in fact risk, 
ri the, the, the tendency to talk about risk all the time around uncertainty, which has been raised, is because there are such powerful pressures to close down and treat the picture as being artificially reduced in some way. Likewise, innovation systems close down very quickly around particular trajectories. And these, these are not avoidable, they're not necessarily even bad, but they are very important features of the innovation and the science environment. And I think it's crucial to acknowledging Tim's point around uh, addressing power-based outcomes, that we need to pay more attention explicitly to speaking about power. That's one important way of actually fostering greater trust, but I'd, I'd be very interested, in, especially to Mark's understanding of how important power is in the closing down to risk and the closing down of innovation. I'm, I'm not sure I've used the word power, it's democracy actually. At the end of the day, we live in democratic societies, we elect politicians who ultimately yeah. make decisions in the face of you know, competing um, uh, choices, and that's what democracy is all about. And you know, the issue of timescale came up before uh, you brought it up. Um, and you know, the challenge is, well, what system would you prefer? You know, that's that we, so we, we have a balance between elections every five years or so, and do you want an election every 20 years? I suspect probably not. And so uh, you know, how do you match, and the investment world is a very interesting world. I came from the Wellcome Trust where we had a large investment, and it's, it's an important decision as to the time scale over which you invest, you incentivize your investment managers so that they don't make too short-term decisions. But I mean, all of these things are compromises, actually. Can I, can I come in on that one? Because in a way, he would say that, wouldn't he? Um, uh, the, the, I think that actually the gap is between the word trust, the word democracy, and those who see the decisions hasn't been taken and power is floating around somewhere in there. The problem is that the way decisions are perceived in science by people who are not involved, don't fit the model of your electing your MP to go into the Houses of Parliament and represent you and a whole process of democratic rule in which they are then responsible for overseeing um, and creating the trust on your behalf to hand back decisions. Because, as we know, there is only one MP, Julian Huppert, with a higher degree in science among the 660 in the, or however many, in the House of Commons, and very little scientific knowledge there. Now, it doesn't matter, Mark, um, in terms of your end of it, but it does matter, I think, to constituents. I think constituents who then go to a constituency surgery and say to their MP, well, you know, they just take you, know, we're just about to get fracking on our doorstep, um, and um, explain to me why that's happening. And, there's no explanation forthcoming, and why? Well, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> and um, um, and um, uh, and and somewhere there has to be a place where trust can be seen to reside for those on behalf of whom the decisions are taken. And balancing all the things that we've heard so beautifully have to be balanced. So I've just at the last word on my worked example. I'm only talking about it because it's the only one I know. It was an inspired decision, of, I think. Um, it was Andrew Rawls, anyway, the Secretary of State. It was an inspired decision to hand that consultation to the regulator, who were an arm's length body with no opinion in the, known as it were officially to have no opinion, to conduct the consultation. Because then we then simply handed it back. We, d we weren't even allowed to give a steer to the minister. We had to just give the outcomes. And I think that's a way in which you can have trust um, but I, I really want to say once again, it does not look like democracy to, to those whose MPs, whose elected representatives um, are struggling themselves with some of the issues. Okay, but to respond in two parts. Firstly, you simply can't blame the MPs who are there for the fact they're not scientists. Yeah. You can blame all the scientists who don't stand to become yes, MPs. Okay. Uh, you know, that's, I'm not that's, blaming that, that's the reality. Uh, and, but, but it's a question that comes up often. And so people sort of blame me for it. But I mean, <laughs> you know, if you want more scientists in politics, then more scientists have to stand. It's as simple as that. You know, they're not unrepresentative of the pool of um, people that stand for election. The, the second thing is, and you, you'll see that we, you know, the authors do not all agree, um, and and that's part of the healthy aspect of this. This is about debate. Um, but but science itself, of course, is not mediated by power. I mean, science is the most challenging bottom-up process where something is discovered, it's refereed, it's published, someone else publishes something, the knowledge emerges. And so science is actually not a top-down 
power-mediated activity. That wasn't what I was no, saying. No, I know it wasn't, but I mean, it, but it was, but it, no, I know, I know you weren't. I was just wondering what you said. It'd be interesting to hear from Joyce and from David That's as well, because they were both authors. Uh, there, there are other authors as well, I know. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think, yeah, Joyce and David want to come in, and then Andy maybe want to respond as well, and then we'll open it up again. Yes, I, I think one of the things I dealt with in the section I wrote was uh, the role of regulatory systems as mediating that relationship between risk and innovation, dis helping to decide what actually reaches a marketplace at the end of the day uh, in terms of the potential from all the scientific knowledge that we're producing. And um, I think a particular issue in the context of the European government is the extent to which the regulatory system in some areas is politicized and, and so that risk regulation is kind of used as a way of reassuring the public, not as a way of dealing with real genuine risks at the end of the day. And, and then you have kind of regulation by um, opinion poll uh, in a way which is very unhealthy for what actually emerges within the regulatory system. And that, that's the way the values are adopted and used to influence the regulators. And I, and I think trust in the regulatory system is not served well in the long run by regulators being overly influenced by pressure group politics. And, and I think that's something we have to consider in this whole area. Pass it forward. Yeah, yeah uh, David Spiegelt, I did the, um, some of the stuff on, on framing of risks. And uh, I suppose it, no matter how big the, any consultation is, in the end, the publics will be getting a lot of their stuff from the media. Yeah. And uh, the media have not got a great you know, history on dealing with some of the issues we've been talking about today. And I just wondered how, given the importance of the media, but uh, in all, all aspects, uh, what the panel thinks about how the uh, coverage of these tricky issues can be improved. <laughs> Andy, did you want to I get, come in? On a absolutely agree with what Sir Mark said about, I mean, in my term, science is a pretty much good candidate for the best set of social practices we've yet discovered for protecting knowledge from the effects of power, for reasons you said. But I think the idea that science, that power is absent from science itself, let alone, would be a rather dangerous one. So I, I just wanted to invite you to qualify that in implication. Thank you. And I think we've really got time really only for one last round of questions before we ask the panel to respond to whichever questions they can and then, and then sum up. I've seen uh, two, two questions yeah, from people that have. Um, thank you. Yeah, Carl Allen, I'm a member of the public and I am a pensioner. So that makes me an expert member of the public in a way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the public willingness to implement innovation and accept risk through the process of consultation now, this is a modern democracy which has a number of complex and connected issues and the public is being asked to respond through consultation. But none, none of the consultation experts are saying, look, do we, as a consequence of this, will we end up with a four-day work week <laughs> <laughs> with one working day devoted to consultation? because democracy in terms of uh, how power is shared and how decisions are made is simply not working. Thank you. A question in the corner. Uh, Mike Bushell from Syngenta. Um, I think the one thing that we've not probably talked enough about today is more on the innovation side. Yeah. It's about risk and reward. Um, reward seem to be being seen as a negative thing that um, benefits some people um, because we're taking a fairly narrow view there. I think we have to recognize that we're in a global economy and rewards and benefits of technologies need to be seen in a very wide context, that we would like those benefits to be felt in economic activity in Europe and the UK and in jobs, as well as in individual companies that benefit from bringing those technologies forward. Um, because the other risk on this side is if we talk ourselves out of technology leadership in Europe, those technologies are just deployed elsewhere and the benefits go with them. Thank you. And, and the last question from the front. Uh, James Wilson from Spru. Mark, you highlighted um, strengthening the evidence base for EU policymaking in your, in your remarks and I just wondered if you had any comments in light of the uh, 
seeming abolition of Anne Glover's role uh, within the European Commission on the optimal organisation of scientific advice within uh, the European Commission. Thank you. Oh, and one last, 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 very, very last question. <laughs> And I, I, I couldn't resist not asking this. This is Michaela Smith, the Chief Executive of CPTM, Commonwealth Partnership for Technology Management. Sorry for my... I, uh, last week, I was at a very unusual uh, discussion in CERN, where, which was uh, <coughs> put together by, uh, instigated by International Standards Organization, ISO, and the whole discussion was about innovation and standards, standards, innovation, similar to the kind of things you have in your report. And uh, obviously the discussion was also, would there be a standards committee, an ISO standards committee, to develop an innovation standards? And that, that is, <coughs> I asked who is from Britain involved in, and is BSI. Now, is BSI in any way on this issue connected with Horizon or any other discussions that the chief scientist might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I mean, we've, that, that's four, four important but quite diverse questions from the very nature of democracy and, and how long it takes <laughs> and how good our so institutions are <laughs> to questions about the, the different places and ways to incentivize the kinds of innovations that are needed. A very particular and pressing question, obviously, about um, the chief scientific advisor and how that's structured in the European Commission and, and standards. So, I mean, if the measure of a good conversation is we've got lots of great people asking you know, lots of questions and talking in, 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 in about important things, but from different perspectives. And this is certainly a good conversation, but with that, I will leave it to the panel to pick up. To sum up. Well, which, which elements of those questions they wish and, and leave us with a sort of parting thought. And perhaps if we start with Lisa yeah. and work then. Well, so, you know, given it's something I can, I'm a communicator, right? So the question, David's question about the media, I think is a salient one. I'm also an educator. And so that's really, seems that, you know, that it, it all comes back to education. It all comes back to if primary school education, if ours, because some European countries do, uh, contain a stronger measure of science so that uh, young women and men were equally easy with the scientific language, with understanding the scientific method, then they would be less victim of the media in what is thrown at them. And I just come back, you know, Women in the audience who know you look at the Daily Mail, we never look at the Daily Mail, and they put up pictures of, um, of, of Princess Catherine in one outfit and they say, fail, and then they put up another and they say, success, you know. And we pay no attention to that whatsoever, you know, to the, their judgment of, we read over it, it's entertainment, <coughs> you know. I, it sounds really, in this gathering, a little bit frivolous, but I want us to get to a position where every young person in this country who will eventually become an old person is so at ease with scientific language, method, and debate that they can take their pick and make their decisions and read past the headlines, and then we really will be somewhere. And if you just allow me one comment on social media, because some people in this room know I am an avid tweeter, and I'm wondering how many people are, are tweeting in the room at this moment. Um, don't be duped. It's just like the internet, you know, the, the, the wonderful democracy of social media. Just go onto the Twitter feed for that poor scientist who wore the shirt with the, um, uh, which was being given to by, by a woman friend, apparently. If you went onto the Twitter feed, you would believe that the entire universe cared more about his shirt and about pillorying him for wearing that shirt than any of the science that came out of the landing. So social media are just another of those axes along which we have to exercise discretion and educate. We did raise that in the report, Visa. Um, yes, I know. Ab about the unintended consequences. Three very quick points. One around the question of innovation. I, I think we underestimate the nature of the way in which inequality is becoming embedded in the way society is changing. And I think one of the issues of this particular report, and what I hope will go on from it, is to be more systematic in the changing toward fairness and equality of the outcomes of innovation. But as things stand now, the process of power is leading inexorably to more people losing and a very small number of people gaining, even under what seems like very benign technology. Two, never underestimate what Lisa has said, we're all saying, uh, deliberation is not just about knowledge, it's about citizenship, responsibility, empathy, common understanding, and the willingness to be able to share a future with each other without feeling that you're sacrificing. 
you're actually part of something which is a greater whole than you are. If we can get that into our society, we've got deliberation. But we don't do that, we don't think like that, and we ought to. Thirdly, this is a report for the world, not just for the United Kingdom, not even for the UK. We should get this report and its learning process across the globe, because all the things that are in here are not relevant just to this nation, not even to the European Union, but it certainly needs to be given greater attention, because I do worry about the change of science advice in the European Union, and Mark might want to say something about that, but, but because it is actually relevant to the way in which innovation and risk are handled globally in all of its manifestations, which, by the way, are in this report. Okay. Well, I mean, it's been a fantastic debate. So let me pick up some of those points. I want to start with Mike Bushell's point, which is actually a terribly important point, which is at the end of the day, there are many challenges and opportunities from innovation. People talk about knowledge-based economies. The opposite of an ignorance-based economy is not an attractive one. Uh, we are an innovative nation, and we need to innovate. Um, we need to do it well. Um, and the economic argument is part of it as well. So we have to innovate to manage many of the risks we face. We are in a world where economies are advancing by innovation, and we need to be part of that. That's the first thing to say. Um, the second thing to say is just the, the gentleman who was talking about uh, the sort of the issues of public consultation. It goes to actually the title of Lisa's chapter. Ultimately, a decision has to be made. Um, we have public consultation, but we can't do everything by um, uh, referenda. And, and so that's why we have democratically elected politicians. They make decisions on our behalf. Um, but public consultation is important around the things we've been talking about today. Um, the third thing is I, around James' question, which is a very specific question about scientific advice in the European Commission. Um, one of the challenges, I think, is to... Uh, there's no question that science needs to feed into the decisions that um, our policymakers make, because so many of them are about issues which have science, engineering, technology, and social science as part of them. Um, and so science advice is important, and I think we're fortunate in the UK to have such a well-embedded system of scientific advice. Uh, you and I were recently at a meeting in New Zealand where it was acknowledged that actually there are all sorts of different mechanisms for getting scientific advice into government. There isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, um, Anne Glover did a terrific job. She was the first uh, chief scientist in Europe. She reported to the president of the commission rather than the commission as a whole um, and didn't have much of the machinery to have the most possible impact. So I think the question actually is, what will be the mechanism for feeding scientific advice into the European Commission in the future? That's important, and we need to make the case. But I think we need to make the case that scientific advice is needed, rather than any one particular structure, because there are several ways in which this can be achieved. So I think that's the important point there. Um, but I, you know, I will go back to where I started before, which is to say, it's been a fantastic process putting this together. Um, the, 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 um, we don't all agree about everything. Um, I think we all agree that it is important to have the right discussions, to recognize, in fact, that we are coming at it from different angles. And actually, I think clarity about the conversation is the most important thing to come out of all of this. We, we may disagree about individual aspects, but we need to be clear when we're talking about science on the one hand, when we're talking about values on the other, when we're talking about the distribution of benefits and potential harms, all of those things we need to be much clearer about, rather than pretending it's all simply a, is the science good or is the science bad? We can't talk about new technologies generically, the question of, are oh, is synthetic biology a good thing or a bad thing? It all depends, is the answer. Excellent. Excellent note to end on. All I need to do is uh, uh, end with a few thank yous. Thank you to you for coming. Thank you to the Institute for Government and Royal Society of Chemistry for hosting this event. Thank you to... Uh, Lisa, Tim, um, Sir Mark, but I think um, particularly as well the other authors mm -hmm. of the report for what I think is a, a fantastic, very promising report. And so with that, thank you.